Welcome to worship at Blacksburg Presbyterian Church. Whether you're sitting in the pew or logging on to your computer, we're so glad that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. And this is a community where everyone is welcome, not in spite of who you are, but because of it. We welcome everyone to bring their gifts and their personhood and their being and everything about you into this space and into our worship and our life together. And to that end, Sarah has a couple of announcements for us. Welcome to worship at VPC. As usual, we invite you to sign the friendship registers at the ends of your pews. Put your name on them. Make sure the people in the pew know who you are and that you greet the people who are sitting around you and you can greet them by name. Uh, your bulletin provides your liturgy plus all the announcements, so please read that to find out what's going on uh, in the next hour plus afterwards. Um, if there's a prayer of the people that you, yeah, prayer that you would like to have read during the prayers of the people, there are cards at the ends of the pews and in the pew racks. Please put a single sentence legible prayer and have it ready for us to pick up right at the end of the sermon, the beginning of the hymn that comes after that. So there are several things to take note of today. I want to begin with a big thank you to Reverend Emily Rhodes Hunter for leaving worship today and Sarah Wiles' absence. Sarah's continuing education leave has been extended just a bit because she has been recovering from COVID. She's back in town, she's testing negative and feeling good, but we needed to make a decision early in the week to be on the safe side and to save Emily's sanity by not calling her on her on Saturday night. So... Um, Sarah will be back in the office tomorrow, and session will meet in Hatcher tonight. Um, um, the fellowship hall is taken this week by To Our House, which started yesterday. It's the winters, our community's winter shelter that we host, and it continues through the rest of this week through Friday night. And there are still a few volunteer slots available. The list is in the gathering space where we hope everyone will go after worship for. Um, fellowship and cookies and lemonade and if and, and if you have not yet volunteered with to our house you can find the list there and sign up on an empty slot because it goes through Friday we've still got several days um, on and we also invite you after worship to attend an art forum in the library Westminster Hall where we will hear from Larry Bechtel, who's up here in front, and Ann Shawhan and Haley Bechtel about the sculptures and paintings that have been there. So you don't want to miss that. Join us in, the, in Westminster after worship. Um, on Wednesday, we begin our 28-day racial equity habit building challenge. And to that end, you have a tracker in your bulletin. I like trackers because they serve as really good motivators. You know, it's like, oh, there's the tracker lying on my kitchen table. I have forgotten to do my thing today. So if you would like to participate in this, and we encourage you to do so, there's a link that you need to go to. It's completely online with literally hundreds of different activities you can do, most of them that, that don't take very long. But the idea is, the way we've set it up anyway, is it's a 21-day challenge online, but we're doing it as a whole month challenge. So that gives you seven free days that you could be <laughs> too busy <laughs> if you if you want to, or you can do 28 things, or more than 28 things, and we'll be providing some things here in the building that you can join in to as well. That starts Wednesday, and we hope that you will join it and find out no matter where you are in the process of learning about and acting upon racial equity that you will advance farther into building better habits in that regard. Next Sunday, the Congregational Annual Meeting will be after worship. Next Sunday, the Presbyterian Women Annual Meeting will be at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And now I invite Beth Matson to do a minute for mission. Good morning. The minute for mission today is the small but very dedicated group called Helping Neighbors. We've been in existence for many years now, and once COVID happened, we moved to doing this work over the phone. Some of you are probably going, what? in the world do you do? Well, we help those in our neighborhood in the Blacksburg, Christiansburg, Radford, and even Reiner, I suppose, so we don't get very many from there, um, who are looking for help in an emergency situation. Their electric's about to be turned off, their water's about to be turned off, their rent, they're about to um, be in arrears for their rent, and 
we donate from the Deacon's Fund a certain amount. We lowered it back down from our COVID days. Um, they're only um, able to come to us once a year. We also point them to other locations where other churches and the keep that um, provide services also. Rhonda Walker, our secretary, is a huge help in all of this. And we could certainly use more volunteers. We do it on Wednesdays. Usually only takes 45 minutes of your time at the most, spread out over the course of the day, phone calls, and um, filling out very simple forms. So if you're interested and would like to find out more, please feel free to talk to me or let Rhonda Walker know. Thank you. Thank you, Beth, for telling us about a ministry that goes on all the time, kind of invisible to the rest of us, but it's very valuable. Let us now center ourselves as we begin worship together. Please rise in body or in spirit and let us lift our voices together as we worship God. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the kingdom of glory may come. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors that the King of glory may come in, that we may see the light of God's love shining before us.
Let us pray. Lord of mercy and joy, you have given to us the blessing of your Son, Jesus, who will make known your presence, forgiveness, and love to each one of us. Be with us this day and keep our hearts and minds open to receive your love and peace. Enable each of us to be people of joy and hope as we encounter others. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Please be seated. But when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children of God. Trusting in this promise, let us now confess our sin before God and one another. Let us pray. Merciful God, you catch us off guard. Unlike Simeon and Anna, we aren't always watching and waiting certain that you will make your presence known in our lives. Though you are faithful from generation to generation, we doubt your promises. We get so caught up in the doom and gloom of this world that we fail to notice your light breaking through. We pray that, like Jesus, you would grow in wisdom and understanding. Bless us with moments of epiphany, that we may come to know you and love you more fully. Amen. Behold, God has given God's Son that we might have life, new, vital, sparkling. Feel the wondrous power and love of God in your heart this day. And know that God is with you always. Thanks be to God. We encourage you to pass the peace to each other, and we invite the children of the congregation to come forward for a time of sharing faith together. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Good morning. How are you guys? Good. I have a question. Um, can you all look this way, please? Thank you. Um, where did you sleep last night? In a bed. In bed, good. Where is your bed? In your room, in your house, right? Okay, wonderful. I would guess that most of us were able to sleep in a bed in our house last night. There are some people, some of our neighbors, who don't have a, a, a house to sleep in. They don't have their own bed. So um, there are this a group of people in this community thought this is not right. God tells us what are the two things we're supposed to do, especially love God and love our neighbors as ourselves, right? So if some of our neighbors don't have a place to sleep, people got together and thought, it is cold outside. Would you want to sleep outside last night without, no, it's just too cold. So a bunch of churches and different people in, in this area thought, we could take a turn. They could come and sleep in our church for a week, and then they could sleep in another church for a week, and another one. So um, we had, there were, looks like there were 13 of our neighbors slept in Fellowship Hall last night. And so um, Sarah Wines talked about this a little bit. But so what do you need other than a place to sleep? What do you need to live? Food, that's right. Very good. Um, toast. Is that what you said? No. Clothes. Clothes. Sorry, I, mean, I didn't hear quite right. Okay, like well, toast. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, we need all of those things. So uh, people in our congregation have, are spending time making food and bringing it in. There are people who are coming and are spending the night in the church. Have any of you ever slept in the church overnight? Nope. Sort of fun. It's a little weird when it's all dark and empty. It's a, but, <laughs> but have you slept at a church before? No. Good. Well, so there are people who volunteer to stay and be hosts so that if there, if there are questions that come up in the night, then um, there's somebody who can help with that. Um, there are people who drive them over to, I think, I'm not certain about this. They drive them to get showers, I think, at the, at the town community center. Um, because we don't have a shower in the church, but, you know, it's nice to get clean once in a while, right? There are people who wash their clothes, so you did talk about clothes. So people who wash clothes for, for our guests. Um, so after church... Um, you might peek your head into Fellowship Hall and just look and see. Um, when, so you sleep, your bed is inside your bedroom, right? So, so you have some privacy within your house. So what's, there's some, have, have any of you looked, looked in Fellowship Hall? Have you seen what's in there? What's in there? There are a bunch of tents. So that within Fellowship Hall, they have a place to sleep, but they also have a little bit of privacy which is something that could be kind of hard to come by if you, if you don't have your own, own home to go to. So, yeah? You're right. There are tables. There's a big table where they can eat together, and each there's a little tent next, a little table next to each tent, and there's a lot of food in the kitchen that people bring food for dinner and for breakfast, and so they... Busy bringing you this. That's going to be delicious. I bet they love it. And they can pack a lunch and take it um, with with them for the day, so they have some food during the day. So these are ways that we can love one another. We can love our neighbors. Um, does your neighbor have to be somebody who lives right next door to you? No. Neighbors are any of the people in our community or even in our world, in your block, but even in our town or even in our world. We, our neighbors are everybody because we're all made in God's image. Yeah. One last question. Do you have a question? No. Let's pray. Repeat after me. Loving God, thank you for watching all of our neighbors, helping us love our neighbors, and watching over all of your children. In Jesus' name, amen. In preparation for hearing God's word read and proclaimed, let us pray. Gracious God, as your word is read and proclaimed, shine the light of your love in our hearts. May we recognize Emmanuel, God with us, in this sacred story handed down from generation to generation. A reading from Luke chapter 2. Listen to what the Spirit is saying to the church. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. 
guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him up in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul also. There was also a prophet, Anna, daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer day and night. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they'd finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Holy Wisdom Holy word. Thanks be to God. You know what I was not doing at eight days postpartum? Walking or riding a donkey six miles from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. I mean, my goodness, this teenage girl had just given birth in a disgusting barn far from home. She would have been torn and bleeding, sleeping only two hours at a time, and nursing through blood, sweat, and tears. I'm betting she wasn't really in the mood for a hike. Suffice it to say, Mary was a trooper. Protestants don't give her nearly enough credit, if you ask me. So Luke's gospel is the go-to for every Christmas pageant and every Christmas card, he sure doesn't let us linger at the manger very long. There are no wise men, no fancy gifts, no star over Bethlehem in his account. As soon as Mary had given birth and the shepherds had come and gone, the camera fades out, and our scripture reading this morning cuts to a new scene wherein the infant Jesus is presented at the temple in Jerusalem. Like any good Jewish parents, Mary and Joseph know that the birth of a child, especially a firstborn son, entails certain rituals, according to the Mosaic law. As was customary, Mary needed to be purified after giving birth, and Jesus would be dedicated to God with an offering of praise. Though the size of the offering was modest, just two pigeons or a pair of turtle doves, the intention was clear. From his earliest days, Mary and Joseph would, excuse me, they would raise Jesus within the community of faith, teaching him God's faithfulness throughout the generations, encouraging him to claim his place in the ongoing story of God's covenant people. Remembering the words of the angel, which Mary had long since pondered in her heart, they knew that God had great plans for this child and that envisioning his future meant connecting him with his Jewish present. I remember, I imagine that their presence in the temple was unobtrusive at first glance. They probably looked like any other young family, parents bleary-eyed with exhaustion, yet full of love as they cradled their son. People probably smiled at the newborn the way most people do at the sight of a new parent 
holding a precious baby. Maybe folks oohed and awed as they counted his ten little toes and remarked on his handsomeness. Yet in the midst of these passing glances and these brief words of congratulations, something prompted Simeon and Anna to look a little closer than the other temple goers. Seeing the holiness in the midst of the ordinary is an acquired skill, and years of faithfulness had taught them well. After the loss of her husband, just seven years into their marriage, Anna had spent almost all of her adult life in the temple, committed to a life of fasting and prayer as she worshipped God day and night. Now, well into her 80s, she'd grown in wisdom and grace over the course of a lifetime, and nothing brought her more joy than sharing these gifts with others. Simeon, too, was said to be righteous and devout, The Holy Spirit rested on him, and though he was also advanced in age, he continued to believe what God had revealed to him, that he would see the Messiah with his own two eyes during his lifetime. Both Anna and Simeon had trained their eyes to see and their hearts to discern God's work in the world. Guided by the Spirit that day, they perceived that God was about to do a new thing, As they spotted the child, their hearts leapt for joy and their spirits were overcome with praise. In this newborn baby's face, Anna and Simeon recognized not just the hopes of eager young parents, but the longings of their hearts and the hope of all of Israel. This was the one they'd been waiting for, the one the prophets spoke of in the days of old, the one who would usher in God's salvation and light and revelation and glory. Suddenly, their joy gave way to boldness as they approached the child. Simeon took him in his arms and began to speak words of blessing and praise, warning and prophecy. In this stunning moment of recognition, Simeon and Anna see the future of God's people even as they hearken back to the ancestral promise of God's covenant. The elderly embrace the infant, blessing him, welcoming him, and offering words of assurance, hope, and joy. The Christ child returns these blessings to them, offering them a sense of continuity, of legacy, a culmination of their faithful watching and waiting, a fulfillment of their hopes. And let's not forget Mary and Joseph. The young parents offer a commitment to teaching their child the story of their faith and dedicate him to the Lord in the presence of the gathered community. And yet they too receive a blessing. Simeon forewarns them of all that is to come. He tells them that their joy will be mingled with pain and that Christ will be for us a suffering Savior. What's remarkable to me about this story is that God brings together all three generations in this place of worship to mutually encourage one another. Not only are they blessed, but each offers a blessing. The young and the old and the in-between, all come together to worship and to praise, to celebrate and anticipate, to hope and to learn and to grow in faith together as they discern what God's doing in their midst. The church is one of the few places in our society where there's the potential for people to come together across our differences to form intergenerational relationships and to build community with one another. Parker Palmer, a Quaker columnist who writes about faith for the blog On Being, describes intergenerational relationships as one of the church's greatest untapped resources. He writes, let's stop talking about passing the baton to the young as we elders finish running our laps. Let's change the metaphor 
and invite young adults to join the orchestra. As we sit together, we can help them learn to play their instruments while they help us learn the music of the emerging world, which they hear more clearly than we do. Together, we can co-create something lovelier and more alive than the current cacophony, a co-creation in which dissonance has a place but does not dominate. Palmer goes on to say, many people die with all their music still in them. I was saved from that sad fate, he explains, by a series of mentors who reached out to me when I was young and helped me find my own music and learn how to play it well. Today, at age 77, I have the chance to pass that gift along to the rising generation whose music is still waiting to be heard. So does everyone who's within reach of a younger person. But age has taught me, he says, that mentoring is not a one-way street. It's a mutuality in which two people evoke the potentials in one another. Mentoring is a gift exchange in which we elders receive at least as much as we give, often more. As elders, we know, or we should know, that we have gifts to offer the young. Depending on the area in question, we've been there and done that, fallen down and gotten up, learned from our failures, lived to tell the story, and gone on to get at least a few things right. We can share those lessons with the young and then help them clear a path through the thickets of life and work. The young, too, bring gifts of energy and vision and hope that hard experience and the erosions of time may have stolen from us without us even knowing it. They challenge our cynicism and even save us from despair when they see a possibility that we'd probably dismiss but come at it from a new angle that just might work. Once more into the breach, we think, and we'll go with them. Palmer describes with keen insight the blessings made possible when we gather together across generations. This pattern of life together is evident in this story of Jesus' dedication at the temple, and it's instructive for us as a church community. As our scripture reading reminds us, we have to connect with our past in order to envision our future. And we have to see where we are and where we're headed in order to contextualize our past. In other words, whether we're older or younger or somewhere in between, we need each other. And so in our life together, may we reach out to someone who's different than us. May we mentor a younger person. May we visit an older friend or reconnect with a dear mentor. May we hear one another's stories and share our joys and challenges with one another. May we learn and grow together across all that divides us, praising God for what has been and what is still to come as we strive to be God's beloved community. May we be blessed and may we be a blessing. Amen.
Please be seated. Part of what it means to be the church is praying with one another, weeping with those who weep, and rejoicing with those who rejoice. And so in that spirit, let us offer our hearts to God in prayer. Holy Spirit, as you rested on Simeon and Anna, so rest on us. Keep us expectant and open to your appearing. Fill our speech with stories of your praise and glory. Holy Spirit, you reveal salvation to every person. Reveal it again to us. Shine your light on every motivation, on every hidden thing. Pierce our souls so nothing that we say or do opposes you. Holy Spirit, you guide us from generation to generation. Continue to point us forward, eyes open, steady and true. Lead us to a faithful end so we may rest in peace forever with you. For we trust in the promised one, Jesus Christ, to whom we offer these prayers and those of our community. For Sheridan Bell, recovering from shingles. For all those suffering in Ukraine, in our nation, and around the world. We ask your care for all who have had surgery or are having surgery and cancer treatments. We pray for seniors in high school and their families going through college application process. We pray for the city of Memphis and all those grieving the killing of Tyree Nichols at the hands of police. And now we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, all that we have and all that we are is a gift from God. Now let us return a portion of these gifts to Christ's service.
Let us pray. Receive these gifts, O God. Help us to use our time, our talents, and our treasure in service to you. May these offerings further your work in the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, may joy and nothing less find you on the way. May you be blessed, and may you be a blessing. And may light, Christ's own crucified and risen life, guide you and countless others all the way home. Amen.